Welcome back. I'm David the Good. Today I'm going to share with you an in-depth presentation on grocery row gardening and we're going to see the creation of a grocery row garden from beginning to end and then we will visit it again after it's been in production for a couple of months so you can see just how fast the production comes in in this cool permaculture gardening system that I've been working on for some years. So we had a chance to build a grocery row garden in a little suburban backyard on a smaller scale than the grocery row garden I'm sitting in here. And I thought this would be really encouraging for someone who's considering the idea. You know, could this work in a smaller space? Yes. And today I'm going to show you how and we're going to join our friends Leo and Sherry and my wife is going to film as we put together a beautiful grocery row garden from beginning to end so you can see step by step how it works. My family and I live in Lower Alabama, Zone 8B. And our friends Leo and Sherry came and visited the grocery row garden system at our previous house where we were renting before we moved and we built this one here. And it put a bit of an idea into Sherry's head about how she wanted to put in a garden. She's really into natural health and the idea of eating well and not shipping in stuff from all over and how many people have handled your food and what was it done to it and is it GMO and all this. The idea of having a backyard source of food really appealed to her, but they had done some gardening experiments in the past with some raised beds and some herbs and other things that didn't really pan out all that well. But when she saw our grocery row garden in the terrible soil that we had it working in and she saw all that we were pulling in, she said, oh, I want to do this. And so she talked to us and Leo decided to go ahead and tarp an area in the backyard in preparation for putting in a grocery row garden of their own. So I said, look, when you do this, I will totally come over and help. I'll bring my kids over and help. We'll put the entire thing together. In early March, we decided it was time to start the garden. Leo took off the tarp and it left this big dead area that had been beautiful grass with a little bit of clover in it. This had been a lawn and I knew from looking at this lawn that the soil was probably pretty good because the lawn was nice and thick. It wasn't this patchy sandy stuff and it wasn't clay and it wasn't gravel. It was a pretty good thick lawn like you might see in a nice neighborhood where the lawn's been well cared for for years and here you go you got decent soil you got your lawn let's kill it and put some food in and so he put this big tarp over the entire area and he did that the fall before so sometime around October November so he put this tarp down and just left it the entire winter and so when he took it off it left us this big blank canvas to work with so the first thing we did was go and scrape off all of the dead brown grass and reserve it because we were going to use it a little later for some of our mulch. Now before I tilled up the entire area, we discovered that there were some fire ants that had decided they liked this clear area, but Sherry was adamant she didn't want to use any kind of poison to get rid of the fire ants. So we did it the old fashioned way and she put a big pot of water on the stove, brought it up to a boil, and then brought pitcher after pitcher of hot boiling water and dumped it right down into the middle of those piles. And I think she took way too much glee in this method. It's, it's very satisfying in a sick way. And, and she definitely enjoyed boiling all of those nasty ants to death. The reason we decided to till was because this was going to be a quick one day get these beds in process. Now you don't need to till to build a grocery row garden. If you are just like, I don't want to till at all ever, not a big deal. What you can do instead of tilling is you can do the lasagna garden method. You could cover the entire area with cardboard, then mulch over the beds and use higher organic matter levels in the beds and just use wood chips or something in the pathways. Perfectly okay. It's not gonna affect it and it may even build better soil but we were ready to just get this thing done and we also knew that there were a lot of tree roots running through this area so as we put the tiller through we tilled through three times breaking all kinds of tree roots as we did and then all we had to do was start 
marking the area off. Kind of like a hammer? Yes, it okay. is. It's exactly like a hammer. The beds in a grocery row garden are normally four foot wide. In the many gardens we've put in over the years, we've discovered uh, and basically agreed with other gardeners that four foot wide is a pretty good space. It's not so far that you can't jump over it and you can weed it mostly from one side then weed it from the other side. It might be more efficient you know, for weeding to do maybe a 32 inch bed or even a 30 inch or something like that where you can just reach across the entire thing from one side but then you have a lot more path space and we wanna be efficient. So we're trying to balance out bed space with path space. And a four foot wide bed is better for the small trees that are the heart of the grocery row gardening system. If you had them really tight in a path and really tight in a path, that would not work quite so well. So we did four foot wide beds and normally we would do three foot wide pathways. But in the case of this backyard, when we did the math on it, we realized that the paths were gonna have to be a little more narrow because the space that was underneath that tarp was not that big. So we took four inches off of each one of the pathways. We did 32 inch wide pathways with four foot wide beds. And to make the beds, all we did was dig out the pathways. After we had marked off where those beds and paths were with strings, we just had to go along the string where the pathway was and just shovel out of the pathway into the top of the bed to make nice fluffy mounded beds. Now when you use a tiller, it's not really going that deep. We're talking maybe four or five inches on one of these backyard tillers. So the ground is not really getting loose and fluffy that deep down. It feels like it's loose and fluffy, but it's not that loose and fluffy. So by digging out the beds, we are giving a couple more inches to each one. Dig the pathway out, throw it on top of the bed. You've got these nice, fluffy tops to the beds. When we built our first full grocery row garden system down in the Caribbean, we used two foot wide pathways for most of it. And then I had one area where I had a three foot wide pathway. And what we realized is over the course of the season, as the plants wanted to ramble and grow and vines were covering the ground and some of the larger perennials went into the pathways, that those pathways get choked up really fast. Two foot wide, Seems like a lot when you have some little plants, it's way too little later on. You basically just get a dense garden that's all grown together because you gotta remember the grocery row garden system is a mixture of trees and perennials. You've got wandering vines and you've got brambles and you know cane fruit and all kinds of different things that can spread into the pathways. So that little bit of breathing room is important because of the trees as they grow the perennials as they sprawl through the season and particularly those vining ground cover layer plants that fill the pathways up. If you do two foot wide pathways, it's too tight. It just is going to be difficult unless you really are gonna stay on top of it and you're gonna keep stuff really small and maybe plant less aggressive plants. You could even go all the way to four foot wide pathways and spread things, things out even wider than you think and it would do excellently, I'm sure. But our compromise is we want less path space, more bed space, and about the minimum on path space for us has been 36 inches, so that's what we stuck with, except for this particular garden where we went down four inches on each one, which I don't think is gonna make that big a difference. Once we finished making our beautiful mounded beds, we raked back all of the dead grass that we had reserved at the beginning that had been killed by the tarp, and we put it down the pathways free mulch and then we were ready to plant. We didn't have enough time the first day to actually plant trees so we had to go out and pick some out and of course asking plant people to go to a nursery and go shopping is uh, it's kind of like asking an alcoholic if he wants to go out for a drink. The answer is always yes. So Sherry and I went to a little nursery that was near their place in the town of Atmore called Atmore Farm and Garden. And we had about 10 fruit trees and 10 perennial shrubs we needed to pick out. And Sherry also wanted to do a little bit of shopping for herbs. So I braved the pollen, which was really messing with me that day. And we took off and we spent maybe an hour and a half, two hours 
picking out some stuff to get ready to plant the garden. Plums are not hard. There's four plums. One says need a pollinator. Three say do not need a pollinator. Yes, so if you plant two varieties of plum, then you've got a pollinator. So okay, maybe you have an early yeah. plum and a late plum, or a gold plum and a blue plum, or... Gold, Roseside, Shirley, and Bruce. So you were just telling me, I said this tree looks great. Right. And, but you said... It's better if you've got one that's not... That doesn't have as ...woken many. up as much yet, because it's less stress on it. It's not losing as much water. So how many people come here and get the trees that look like that and don't do well? Probably that happens a lot. I, like, that's what I would have done. It's best to get it before it wakes up and put it in the ground. It's not, and it's not necessarily the biggest plant in the pot that you want either. If you're getting a potted plant, you want one that's a little smaller See, because I, it's probably not. I would have thought exactly found. the opposite every single time. Yep. The new it's not what you would expect. No. It's like the way God picks us. Didn't expect that. Okay. So you need a, a one that has. See all that new growth. That's good. All that root. We've got to get covered and no as soon as possible. And leaves on the top. It possible. needs more on the bottom. Right. It's just about to wake up, so this is perfect. Okay, I see that. Just budding out, it'll be fine. But otherwise, we've got to water it very carefully. So I'm going to set this one aside here and cover the roots because any time, any time that those roots are uncovered, should we put it in this corner of the bin right here, and we can put all of our stuff yeah, together? What we're getting. So now we just need a pollinator for this one. If there's a good gold one. That would be nice. This gold looks good. The race is not to the fastest. Oh my gosh, I would have totally picked opposite <laughs> that to myself. I mean, totally. Get the stick. You want it to wake up in your garden and then it doesn't even know it's been moved. Okay. As much as possible. That makes sense. So if I count it correctly, you have a couple of you have a couple of figs already, and I have a right. pomegranate for you in the car. Mm. And I have some goji berries for you in the car. And I have a little mulberry for you in the car. So you probably need about, well, as for trees, that's the taller part of it. So you probably need about s six shrubs, meaning various berries or small shrubs, and then probably seven trees. Let's see. Further underneath for longer, it's got more living roots on it. Okay. It's got a lot of life on it. That's well, a Bartlett. Let's put this back underneath for the next person that comes. And now there should be a pollinator for this one too. I recommend pineapple. That is a really good a pear variety for here. That is a hard baking and processing pear, but it's very, very disease resistant. Has a nice flavor. Now explain pollinator. So the trees each have their they both have male and female parts in the flowers, but some of them are self-incompatible, meaning they can't self-pollinate. Okay. Some of them can partially self-pollinate. Some of these pairs actually will still set some crops without another pair. But if you have two of them that can trade pollen, they do much better than if you just have one, usually you do get you have more. To put them closer together, or does it matter if they're a little bit yeah. apart? If they're within okay. probably 500, 1,000 feet and you have bees in the neighborhood, they'll be okay. fine. But in the grocery row garden, where they're all going to be small and close to each other, it's going to be, be really great. easy. You're just waking up. So you're looking for straight. You're looking for lots of roots on the bottom. Look at yeah. It looks like it's alive. It hasn't dried out much. And not a lot of waking up. Not a lot of growth on the top yet. Right. That's the idea. Let's try. I like that one. Okay. That's got a nice shape to it. We'll put this one over here. I saw they had some limes over there. The limes are going to be too touchy on the cold. They'll just uh, freeze to the ground. The satsumas will not. The Miowa kumquat will probably live. That's a very nice one. Kumquats are great. It's a small, sweet. I, I grew up with kumquats. Okay, good. Definitely get that then. Oh, here's another one that would be worth getting. Do you like persimmons? Have you had the big sleeper cinnamon? They're so awesome. This is the astringent type. Astringent. The, the astringent persimmon is tart and like tastes like cotton until it's fully, fully ripe, and then you and eat then it like it's pudding. Oh. And then it's awesome. You eat it when it's totally soft. Okay. This one you eat like an apple. You can eat it off of the tree even before it's fully ripe. It's crisp. There are two different main strains of persimmon. Both of them I love. 
but this is, this, like is the, this is the persimmon appreciator's persimmon. This is the, I can eat it any time. I don't really care. <laughs> but they're both good. Then pick one. I don't care. <laughs> I would stick both of them in. Okay. Then you have to hope that you like persimmons. If not, you just trade it with somebody. Leo likes them. I know he does. So we need about six shrubs, maybe less, maybe even just five would be fine. Okay. Black satin, I don't know. I usually try to get the varieties from the University of Arkansas, which is, this is Arapaho. They're all named after native tribes. Arapaho is good. Usually, again, you want a couple of them so they pollinate each other. That one looks like pretty good Like one putting me. in one shrub of blackberries. How many is that going to give you throughout the year? You can get, if they take off, you could get a quart to a half a gallon. Mama! Maybe more. If you, Mama. if you train them and you really feed them up and everything, you could get a bunch. But generally, I just get a quart or so. And, and I don't actually know how many we get usually because the kids eat them all. Because <laughs> they just so eat them in the garden. So, I don't see them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Chives, sage, those are all good. Basil, oh I, mint. And if you pinch the yeah. center out of the basils repeatedly, yeah, it stays you longer. Keep, yes. Isn't but then you can let some of them go to seed and they'll come out. But isn't it good to, to keep it in a place where they get sun, get a little bit of shade? Because it says full shade, but to me, yeah, like our full sun from morning till night is like too much sun. Full sun here is not full sun You up need north. like yeah. less. You need about four hours. That's right. about it. So it goes in the corner where the, and this the tree goes basil. over and gets some. That's a really good one too. Six bucks for a, okay, it's six bucks for six. So they're a buck each. People keep saying, oh, they're five dollars each. It's like, no, I don't, I don't normally see that. I don't know where people are buying these things. So with the trees, you said not a lot of growth. Same thing with this or opposite with the you don't want them, yeah, you want it to be about half grown, you don't want them to so you don't want the big, big ones. Really big, no, because they're probably growing all the way through. There's too around. many There's too many roots, down. so it's struggling, it starts to circle. This is not bad, but you'll see it, if they've grown all the way to fill the pot and they've started going around at the bottom, when you transplant it, okay, they're not so, so hot at that's getting. That's not bad, but even something like this is. A little bit, a little, a little smaller is better, better. yeah. Oh. Okay. You don't want the biggest one. Well, there we go. I, it's exactly opposite of what I've done in the past. <laughs> but if I don't want cats in my garden, should I not put it in Sometimes there? our cat will go into the garden and just roll around on the catnip, so, yeah. <laughs> you don't want that. I don't want that. What do you think? This cat's looking I for I just it. don't think so. Dad, this the cat's, cat's looking, looking for the nip. Ow. I know the nip is over Ow, here. Oh, it already nipped me. <laughs> do you put a lot of dill in your pickles or sauerkraut? Yeah, when we have it. Usually I don't have it lined up, so I'm getting dill at the same time I'm getting everything else. And that right there is a, that's a ladybug larva. Is that not that's good? That's good. So you get a free ladybug larva. So they eat aphids. So that's what they look like, and then later it'll bust out and turn into a ladybug. Huh? Bust out of that shell. I found the cucumber. Oh, good job. So, question here. If I come to get stuff from here, same yeah. type of thing as over here. You don't want it to be the biggest one. Right. And, and you want to look. Some things do better than others. Like eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers all do really well from transplants. Cucumbers do not. It just really? makes sense to plant cucumber seeds. Why? Because they grow really quickly in the ground and they get a stronger root system. When they get transplanted, the root system is very weak and they tend to suffer. And by the time they actually catch up and they start growing, you might as well have started them from seed. So I don't even know why they do it. Okay, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good thought. So, is it too late to seed them in the garden right now? No, this is perfect timing. Like over the next two or three weeks, anytime. Dad, okay. this is a pickle. Yeah, yeah. What is this one? Fascinating. Keystone red. That is a bell pepper. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. Yep. Bell pepper. We'll Anything else from seeds, later. though? Oh yeah. yeah, I grow all my corn from seeds. I grow all the beans from seeds. Um, 
the only thing I will buy transplants for is usually tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and then a lot of the herbs because the herbs are often slow to start from seed. Unless you start so, like three months before yeah, on the window seal inside right. your house. Tomato! Okay. Thank That's you. a beautiful tomato. That is a nice one. That's an Amelia. We're gonna plant some. Stop pulling them out. We're gonna get them later. <laughs> so the way this is, is this is 33 feet, which means we can get three trees, but then we diagonal it. So three trees in one, then three two trees, three, then three, three trees, and two. then two. Yep. So we've got our 10, 10 trees. Yep. And the ones that get the biggest, I like to put to the furthest edges. So pear trees like to get big and you're gonna have to fight with it a little more. So I like to stick them farther away from each other than, okay. than littler trees. What? So the smaller trees closer to here. Right. Generally I would do that. So you're kind of pushing them a little bit further back. So if you mark our first, so we put our first tree, it's gonna go right there. And, and then you don't walk on You don't the walk on the bed. And then one, two, three, four, that's about the middle. But we know this one's gonna be three, so. so Mark it and then eyeball the middle. Yeah, eyeball the middle. Which is about here. And why am I in shoes? <laughs> It's a, yeah. it's like roughly, yeah, so right about there is the middle. Maybe we could get really meticulous about it. No, we're not. You're not going to do that? No. You don't care? No. Awesome. I'm not that meticulous. So that one's there. There we go. Now you just... No, wait. I mean there. Are you kidding me? The trees in a grocery row garden are the spine of the system. They are the tent poles that holds up the rest of the tent. One of the things about this system that is different from a food forest system is that it's organized on a specific linear spacing pattern. This is like a series of edible hedges. So it's a food forest that's under control. And the difference between this and a regular orchard which is rows of trees in a linear system, is that this is also incorporating your herbaceous layer and your vine layer and your shrub layer and vegetables and all kinds of small fruits and herbs or flowers or whatever else you want to put in there. It is basically like strips of forest with a break, strips of forest with a break, strips of forest with a break. And the trees are important on their spacing because if you don't space the trees properly, you're going to overshadow the entire system or they're gonna run into each other or they're gonna fight. And we are already gonna have to stay on top of the size of those trees using backyard orchard culture principles. And this is a fight to keep them under control that you're gonna to have to do every year until they kind of get balanced out. And that's fine, it's not a big fight, it's just a little bit of pruning. But the spacing at the beginning is important. So what we do is we place them on a diagonal grid. I put my trees 12 feet apart in each row. Then in the next row, I put them 12 feet apart, but I put them on the diagonal to the first row. So I walk to the point in between the first two trees in the next row and I place one and that way you're getting more space between. That way they're not directly across from each other on either side of a three foot wide pathway. You're staggering them. Once you plant all your trees in, then at the six foot mark, the dead center of that 12 foot between trees, you put a perennial shrub. This is what I like to do. I like to put a big berry bush in there or something that is gonna take up that space. It's gonna fill in and be part of that area. That's my shrub layer. So I have my tree layer, are the orchard trees, and then the shrub layer. In this area, it makes sense to plant things like goji berries and blueberries and blackberries. There's a lot of different things we could fit in there. We've got some native edible shrubs or tea plants or things like that we could fit in between that are gonna take up more space than your vegetables, but they don't take up nearly as much space as a tree. So when you have a shrub in one side 
and a tree in the other side, that's not a big problem. They fit together nicely. But if you have tree by tree and shrub by shrub, it doesn't make as much sense. It just makes sense to stagger down the rows. And if you had smaller shrubs, you could obviously take that 12 foot gap between the tree and then just put two in there. I've done that with raspberries and blackberries, put two in the middle. But generally I find that that six foot spacing from a tree really works the best because otherwise I'm kind of pushing it. Things get a little crowded and I don't really have space for my herbs and vegetables when we do that. All right, so then we pick in between the... <laughs> we pick in between. Right, so and then you go over here. It's equidistant, it's right about here. Right. And so there's one. And then you just mark that one. And the equidistant one here. I don't know what you did there, now I can't tell where the middle is. Oh That's too far up. Oh yeah, it is. It's right. close. I feel like it's like a foot through that way. I'm actually tempted to put two pairs into one of the double rows and then run the branches sideways along the row to bend them down. See if we can train them that way. Pears are one of those things that likes to go straight up and make a huge tree. And so you have to really think about it on the beginning, how you're gonna keep it under control. Are you really, really gonna prune it? Super, super prune it? I was thinking we could actually put both pears in one row and then bend the branches sideways. This in the front, the front and so the back. So we can take like a double where the two are and put one here and one here and then bend them to go down the row too. That's another option. There's so many different ways you can train them. They do want to get big. Okay. See, it's like you got to stay on top of them, whatever we do. Okay. Would you rather prune them short or keep them going as fans sideways? I would love to see a big start here. Okay, Let's do it then. You got to get another shovel. Do you have a shovel? I got a little tiny hand one. That's not going to work. All right, you'll be the planter, I'll be the digger. Hey, that works for me. You know, it's supposed to rain like Thursday and Friday, which is good, right? It'll be perfect. Yeah. Okay, so what are we doing? All right, stick it in. Let's see if we can so, what it. are you doing? Just... We need to go a little deeper. Okay. I want to keep those roots if I can. Why does it change the colors of the dirt? There's the top part of the dirt is called soil. That's your main soil, top soil. Uh-huh. Lower is called the subsoil. The top is where most of the biological activity and the oxygen and the humus and everything is taking place. The further down you get, the more it just becomes mineral soil without all of the life. It's like as you go deeper into the ocean, mm -hmm. you don't usually have nearly as many species. The top part is all full of biological life and organic matter. There we go, that's perfect. So below is called the subsoil. You just toss it in. Sometimes what I do is I make a little pack it around. Make a little ring around it, so you have kind of a dam that holds the water in. Okay. And then when you pour it in, it directs it down into the root zone. Don't be in the head. Now I got to do the part that freaks everybody out. Okay. We're gonna cut the center of this out because we want this tree to stay smaller. Ah. We don't want it to go as tall. So we're gonna head it off right at the beginning and try to teach it to stay small. Okay. Is that about as much water as you want? I'll just pour the whole thing in there slowly. Each tree should get a bucket. Bucket that way, I had this about half full. It'll settle. Well. Two -thirds of it the should way settle in wherever there might be gaps in there and bring the dirt down around the roots.
So, guess what, David? What? I'm 49 years old, and this is my very first fruit tree I've ever planted. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can't believe it. May it not be your last. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're cutting these to keep the tree smaller. Right. So it'll start shooting out of these instead of completely. It'll try That's to... That's the idea. We want it to stay smaller, and we want to be able to send it sideways and kind of keep it from going straight up and becoming a big tree. Okay. So as it starts, it's going to grow out through the season, and then we'll come back again in summer, and it'll have side shoots everywhere. Uh -huh. We'll select which ones we want to keep and which ones we want to top off. Okay. And look at how that, see oh, how it's it washed all, down in yeah. there? Now you put the rest of the dirt on top. Now we, yeah, you have to fill it in again because it, it washes it down in. And that's one of the things people miss. They're like, I'm just going to run the hose on it for a sec. It's like, you really got to make sure that there's not air gaps in there that are going to dry the roots out. All right. Slow it down. Work out ever at the gym. That's true. If you just garden all the time. It's the full gardening workout. Haul your buckets. Never get That's a hose. Right. Never get a hose. Never get a hose. Haul your buckets. Get those on. Farmers care. <laughs> I don't like that little wingy one. So how many others are you taking off? Ooh, this that whole thing. Wow. It won't die. Okay. It but just looks scary. That's, that's half the tree. I know, and it's exactly opposite of what we would have bought. I you want it really huge, store. right? <laughs> and yeah, but look at all this little. All this is good. Right? It'll all come out. All these little. It's gonna shoot off of there, and it's gonna go crazy. Okay. I think I'll even take that piece. Even it out. It'll often outgrow a tree. I cut, I planted two peach trees. One of them I left at the six foot height that it came in the pot, didn't do any pruning. Two years later, it was about 10 feet. Another one I cut all the way down to the height of my knee. I just cut it off as a stub. Uh -huh. And when it grew back, it filled out and it was 12, 15 feet in, in two years. It was bigger than the other one. So it appreciated what it. you're saying is trees need Pure they like it. Just like people. People need pruning too. Right. Right. Which is why I always cut in line. All goes back to the Bible. Might take three times as long as him. Not quite as fast as you. You're doing fine. <laughs> I want to take the stake off so hopefully it acclimates and gets strong from the breeze and doesn't have a artificial crutch on it. We'll do what it wants to. Hopefully come around to where we want it to live. Almost there. You'll break that shovel in half. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll try not to. That's right. I think that's it. That good? Yeah, that's good. Okay. That's a kumquat. Okay. So. Now wait a minute. I got questions. A kumquat. Whenever you got a, a plant or a tree that comes in a bucket like this, yes. do you mess with this dirt around here? You leave it as much intact Generally, as possible. Generally, yeah, you leave it as much intact as possible. Do you do the same thing with plants? Yes. Yeah, you don't want to shake it up much. Okay. Some things do better than others. Now, if I came across one where the pot was all full of roots and messed up, I might prune half the top of the tree off and then slice through the circling roots on the side to encourage them to go out sideways. Okay. But it's best, like this one didn't have, it's not root bound, it's growing nicely, 
Hopefully it just works its way right down into the soil from here. So we still do a little... We definitely have to pour a lot of water around it. Okay. So we make a dam. Um, with it, when it's like this, I, I know that the bottom of this is loose and it's going to want to sink in here a little bit. Okay. Well, I got about a fourth of a bucket and I'll pour it and then we'll go get more. It's not quite going quite as quick as when the ants, when we did the ants. <laughs> Those ants were very satisfying. They were. All right, I'm gonna go get more water. So the spacing of this is important. Everything is spaced on diagonals, as you can see, which gives you a little bit more space. It tricks a little bit more space into the rows, which is really important. Now, if we were gonna space a regular orchard, we would give everything another six to 10 feet between trees at least, depending on the species and how big it's gonna get. But these are not gonna ultimately get as big as an orchard. This is a miniature orchard, so they're gonna stay smaller, but we're using the diagonals. If we just went directly across, like from this tree to right here, and put another tree right here, that's much closer than from this tree to the diagonal here. So it, it makes sense. There's a method to it. I want to talk to her about these pigs. See, I don't want, I don't want pigs. Fresh food. I want fresh food as it comes up. Almost all year you can get fresh food. I don't want pigs. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. These figs here I pulled out right alongside where they had rooted into the ground alongside our fig tree. Figs are really easy. They ground layer often on their own. If a branch is touching the ground, it makes a bunch of roots. You can just yank it, particularly at this time of year when they're asleep. So I'm honored you decided to do the uh, grocery row gardening system, my experimental craziness. <laughs> well, I don't want a can. That's why I did it, because I'd rather have food. I just want to go out in the garden and see what there is. And who, I don't want a, I don't want a can. I just don't want a can. I don't want tons and tons of green beans in my, in my pantry. I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have such a mild climate here. There's pretty much something that grows every time of year and you kind of just eat with the seasons. You'll get some figs. At a certain time of the year, you get some plums, then later you get some persimmons, and you're always getting greens and potatoes and different things come in at different times of the year. So it's, it's go out and figure out what you're gonna eat today. Well, and all the health gurus say that that's the best way to eat anyways is with the seasons. Navajo and Arapaho one there and one right there so we know that those are going to be there so it's kind of their opposite each other okay but the, you question, the diagonals but the only question i have is we have the two big trees there and there is that too close to them i think they'll be fine i think they'll overgrow the top a little bit because it's going to come it'll get some shade from it in the morning but it'll have all the afternoon so it's going to go kind of like this right okay should be fine. All right. Good. And Tough. if they get bigger and it looks like it doesn't fit anymore, move them. No, it's just move them. We'll leave the trees and move the trellises. Right, right, right. Okay. Once we have our trees and our shrubs planted, then it's time to plant our smaller items. Now, some of these are going to be perennials like ginger in our climate. If you were further north, you have a lot of other perennials you could choose from. You could put in horseradish. Horseradish doesn't do very well down here, does really well up north. Comfrey and borage and other things like that, they can be useful perennials that are going to be in that system. Put some flowers in if you want to put some flowers in. Put in some daylilies, some edible dahlias. There's all kinds of things that you can kind of tuck in and fit in between however you want to do it. The spacing now is up to you. So once you have your scaffold in place, you just plant around it. This is a garlic. shell ginger. ginger. This one's good for tea. So it's a mild ginger tea. It has a very nice aroma. It's very pretty too. Yeah, and it would have looked prettier if I hadn't let it dry out. It was sitting in my driveway for too long. <laughs> Here's what I bought. 
Bell peppers. Peppers. And other bell peppers. And tomatoes. I didn't get a lot of tiny tomatoes. Cuban all sweet pepper. Or tiny big ones. Poblano, oh. nice. Eggplant. Eggplant, good idea. You guys will have to learn Purple how to bell. make baba ganoush. That's awesome. All right, here, hand it over to you because I'm going to close this. Tell how it's fermented inside. That that piece of sugar cane's done. This one. Oh, that's disgusting. This one's still fine. It'll go great on the compost pile. At least part of it's fine. I don't think all of it's fine. But it's starting to grow at the end, so we know it that that's It smells like a really bad alive. alcoholic drink. It, really is. <laughs> it, it does. Like. <laughs> these each one of these joints can make a new sugar cane. Okay. So I usually plant three to four of them, but I'm gonna just put this entire thing in the ground and hope for the best. I think. So this doesn't need to go down very far? No. Usually about six inches. But when it's warm, it doesn't matter as much because it's not going to freeze. In the winter, I bury them six inches, so they, or in the fall, so they go through the winter. Now, put it a little bit below the surface. We also know that we're going to mulch on top of it. Okay. Later. So what you, what you're saying is these things right here is what grows the shoots. Right, right there. Those are the growth buds. Do you need a, 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 a shovel? Shovel. <laughs> Hello. Now these get tall. So these will be taller than you are. By the end of the summer, they're like this big but then they die back okay so we have to stick them in places where they're in between i usually just stick them in between big trees okay like we have this big gap right here we could go now where do we decide we're putting those arbors that's an arbor right there so there there we go stick one there okay one there and then I, I usually plant small vegetables around them early okay. in the year and then later in the year they're just huge. Okay. So you let's see how my shovel works compared to his. This way or this way? This way. Like in the middle, and then I can garden on either side of them for that a That makes sense. So until you could they get plant. Because these won't get big until June, July is when they start to get big. Okay. There you go. Do you need to put them down as deep as the. Yeah, if you give them, uh, give them a little deeper than I gave that other one. It was hard to dig over there. You can plant these different ways and like you can stick them straight up and down. Like, just dig one hole and stick it halfway in like this and plant it, which works as well. I've done them both ways. Is that deep enough? Oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, you just have to remember they're here. Side. Like that? Perfect. So how are you going to remember? I'm going to cut some privet. Is that what that's called? Yeah. It's like invasive, so we put it to work. When I planted my current garden, I didn't mark stuff because we were in this full-blown panic. We have to move. We have to get everything out of here as soon as possible. And I ended up sticking in tons of roots, which are just coming up now in every conceivable spot. And if I had gone through and had a, like bought a bunch of contractor flags or taken sticks and stuck them in the ground or something, it would have been so much easier. Because now I'm going, where can I plant stuff? I don't even know. So question for no you. No idea. What do you do with your cassava? Uh, we usually uh, 
boil it, uh -huh. and then when, and then pat it dry, uh -huh. and bake it or fry it with garlic and butter and salt, and it it makes really awesome French fries when you fry it in lard or tallow. It's really dense and it's like strong, delicious, starchy. So in the store, you see cassava as flour everywhere. Is right. that possible to do? It's possible. You have to usually soak it for a period of time, chop it up, boil it, soak it, strain it, dry it, then grind it or something like that. Because okay. it's toxic when it's raw. So you have okay. to cook it in order to make it So you just have to YouTube edible, it all so. to find out how to do that. Yeah. Africa knows all about cassava. That's where well, it's Well, I mean, because process. a lot of the gluten-free is cassava flour now. Yep. And it'll say tapioca sometimes, or it'll say cassava. Tapioca yeah. pearls also come from cassava starch. Oh, I didn't know that. Don't you need a good... <laughs> don't I need a sherry to dig that That's salt? right, don't you? <laughs> and this being early in the year, we figured, let's plant potatoes. That way we could get a harvest of potatoes in about 50, 60 days, maybe 70 days, and be pulling in potatoes and get that quick yield during the cool season. While it's still cool, potatoes are good. Once the potatoes are out, then it's time to switch to things like okra and sweet potatoes in our climate. But you'll know what to plant in your climate. Whatever grows well, whatever trees and shrubs and vegetables grow well in your climate, stick to those. And just, you can use the same spacing, same system. Just because you're not an 8B, it doesn't matter. If you were down in Costa Rica, you might use bananas and papayas and prune all kinds of wonderful edibles like Suriname cherry or acerola cherry and fit them into the system. I can't do that here, so I'm not like, oh, I can't do the system. No, here I've got peaches and I've got some apples and I've also got some stuff that's semi-tropical like my cassava and then I've got Jerusalem artichokes from a little further north and then I put in taro roots which grow half the year and then die down the other half. I've got figs. You go further north you can put on all kinds of cherries. Nanking cherry was one that we loved. Sour pie cherries. Oh we loved that when we were in Tennessee. You could put in lots of Jerusalem artichokes if you wanted to. You could put in gooseberries. You can put in currants. You can put in grapes. You can do basically anything that fits inside of your climate and probably a few things that don't exactly fit as the system grows and just experiment and see what happens. Potatoes? Yeah, potatoes Or figure perfect. out where everything else goes. Because everything else, all the smaller, the peppers, all that kind of stuff can kind of go... It can go in between just everything in between else, everything, right? right? Yep. But we talked about putting lettuces back along this to see if they actually grow. Yeah, and if you were going to put... This is the shadiest part. And the lettuces will be out long before the cassava becomes big. Well, should I go get those so, real quick and bring them yeah, back here? The lettuces. You know there's lots of controversy with kale right now. Yeah, kale is poisonous, that's what people have said. Kale's garbage food. Everybody said kale was the greatest thing in the world, but it actually will kill you because it's got oxalic acid in it and it's blah. So I, do you I've eat seen some kale? Of these Sometimes, not often. So what do you believe? I think that the best food in the world is animals. But... <laughs> I but agree. I garden as a hobby. <laughs> I think that a good balance of animal and vegetables is yes. not going to hurt you. Yes. And there's probably, probably kale fried in lard would be an ideal food. Ooh. There you go. All right, so, so keep the tomato out, the bee balm out. Just plant these lettuces all along here. Stick them here and there. Oh, no, you got the lettuce. Kale, oh, you got the kale. The kale will get about that big. Now this is chard over here, so big. put the chard on that side. I wouldn't transplant that chard yet because it's so wilty. Okay. It looks like it's not at all happy. That's and if you transplant happy. it now, it'll probably just die. Okay, so see if set it, perks it out up first. and see if it perks. Okay. Well, I'll take another one of these and stick it on the other side. This is kale too, it looks like a different variety. But it doesn't look as happy as that one. Mm -hmm. Let's see how they do. It's usually pretty forgiving. I see why you use your um, machete to garden. It's a good transplant. That makes sense. Especially when you're doing just little stuff. So would it be worthwhile if you're going to put kale and lettuce back here, do you kale, lettuce, kale? Because it's just varieties of things? Yep, just mix it up. 
you can plant patches of stuff because nature often does that too, but Here's alternating never hurts yellow. anything. They never look great. This looks this like is. black seeded Simpson. What That's a this? tomato. It is? <laughs> it's pretty impressive when you can't see smell it. Oh, I do smell it. Just baby. Slightly. Just slightly. Hope for the best. Huh? They're so delicate compared to trees. Sure. Now, don't as they grow, don't you have to slowly kill off some of the little Some suckers? people do that. Some people prune the suckers off. Yes. We've tried it and not done it, and they've done badly either way. Because <laughs> they're tomatoes. So you're not giving me very much hope is what you're saying. <laughs> so what I get, I get. Eggplant. Eggplant. Okay, what do you have there? Peppers. Peppers. Let me bring you some peppers. You want to help me, William? Alright. Look what pepper did. Oh, be careful. Here, you want to carry these two, William? At the beginning, sometimes it makes sense to just go ahead and direct seed if you wanted to do cover crops on top of the bed. Let's say you just wanted to put in an orchard and plant a whole bunch of green beans or something. Just go ahead and space out green beans over the entire thing. Get a big bed of green beans, that's awesome. Or you could put in your carrots, or you could put in your potatoes. But I find that if you don't mulch early on, if you have a lot of bare soil, Unless you get that cover crop growing real fast, you're going to have a lot of weeding issues. It took us quite a bit of time to reclaim this grocery row garden that I'm sitting in from all the weeds that grew on top of it after we tilled and made the beds in uh, the end of summer last year. So as fall went on and winter went on, all these little weird winter greens and stuff started showing up and then in early spring the entire thing was crowded because we did not have enough mulch on it. So if you can get mulch right from the beginning, that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Put in your vegetables, put in some mulch, whether you're putting in cuttings or direct seeding. If you're direct seeding, make little pockets in the mulch, open it up, maybe put a little compost in there, plant a couple of seeds, let it grow up over the mulch, or put transplants in, but then cover it back again because that's gonna stop the germination of weeds and keep it from becoming a disastrous mess that you're just gonna fight with and get angry at all the time. Right, so we hack holes. Where's this your is, little hacker thing that you use? This is easy. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is the hacker thing I'm using now. I usually have a triangular hoe. It's a oh, digging oh, hoe oh, that sure. is really good for it. Okay. That's good. So just drop a little potato in each one of those. And if it's a big potato, we can cut it up. One into the back. Because I read that the vascular system is better if you cut them that way than if you cut them this way. Because okay. the veins run this way. So it draws better. Oh, look how pretty. Holy cow, that's gorgeous. Isn't that so cool. And you just plop them in. Now, which way? Put them in this way? Or I, this usually way? I usually put them in cut side down. Now, some people let them scab up, but I haven't really noticed that it, it makes that big a difference. It may in some climates. And just cover. Right. I'm sticking this one in whole because it only has one eye on it. The more colorful your vegetables, the higher in antioxidants they are. That's right. So red cabbages have more nutrients than Purple white. potatoes. Yes. Absolutely. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 more to plant. Okay, but we also have some yellow yukon. Well, we got tons more of those. Okay, now we're arboring right here. Right, so we'll come down this. what about this thing right here? We'll find a place for it. Stick it at the base of a tree or something. Okay. So this is all planted, and I've got three holes here. If you want to get really clever, we can alternate the uh, potato varieties. Just put in hole, correct? 
Yeah, any little ones. And they make sure they have a nice eye on them? Yep. Can you, are you going to cover that one up, Pepper? There's one right, there's a couple more to, co to cover up. Look at that. So the ideal for this is the machete. There you go. Yep. So this is propagation via division. <laughs> you know what? There we go. Yay! There's half, and there's half. <laughs> and that won't kill it. If we want to, we could make another one. Now that can go one spot. You lost a piece there. That can go another spot. So I'll take, take some of these back home to stick in. And we'll take this piece. Build your garden out of it. You can cut that one in half? I can divide it now by hand, I think. There you go. These plants with these rhizomes like this are so easy to do this with. So now I've taken like a $20 plant and turned it into $80. They just pot it up or grow it for a couple of months. Why do you think plant places make so much money? I used to run a nursery. <laughs> I know. Now we just have to water it in really well because it's lost a lot of its root system. Now really the last step is just to get mulch into all of it, which will be easier too when the potatoes all come up. But thin mulch they're going to be able to go through without any trouble. So do we water it first or do we um, manure first? Oh, good question. We should throw the manure around the base of the little vegetables in particular. And then we could water them in. Do you want to put your hands in the manure? I'm not excited about that, but I will. It's not bad. It's just like peat moss. It's just uh, clumpy peat moss. Once you disassociate from the fact that it's manure, it's really not bad. Oh, right. okay. It's you have to lie bad. to yourself. Okay, well my mother talks about how they, she grew up on a um, dairy farm. And they'd go out and they would dig their toes in the wet. Oh, <laughs> that's a little intense. Yeah, that's it too. Okay, so that's all I do is just throw oh, it Oh, we just give a little sprinkle. Yep, this will get your herbs going for the whole season. And this is that's all really herbicide good. free because it came from our cows, which don't get fed anything that has graze on in it. Okay, but when it's clumpy, that's when I have a problem. Just crush it out. It's just gross. It has an energy field that heals uh, planter's warts. I'm so excited about it. I don't have any planter's warts. This well, worst, you might get them. This it's is preemptive. The, this is the worst part. Really? <laughs> yes. It has some warts. Good. Okay. I don't What's think I got here? any really wet, sloppy ones. I don't know what's planted in here. I have no idea. I Probably have no potatoes. idea either. Did we put potatoes in there? We'll find out soon. I don't know, but we got to get the arbor up so we can finish that. <laughs> All right. You're doing well. I'm doing that. Yeah. Wonderful. So how long has the manure sat for? This stuff is probably four months just sitting out in the field. So I get it when it's been, I got it all aged from the field because then it's not quite so hot with nitrogen, it's not gonna burn the plants. Okay. The fresh stuff you gotta be a little more careful with. Okay. Is there another bucket? Shall I go grab that? Go other grab bucket? one. Anywhere you see a green plant, throw some manure around it. Great. Hey, Kelsey! Hey, Kelsey! Yeah, no, thanks so much. Come, Kelsey! <laughs> Come, Kelsey!
watch the Poopy Doo with me. I'm not going to, but I'll come watch. Mom, what are you doing? It's really kind of gross. What is wrong with you? Okay, what if I just write in your face? All in your face. Tell me what you think of the garden. Uh, it's a big change from going from grass to what we have now with just uh, a couple of uh, a couple of days in between and a lot of hard work. Um, it's it's exciting and I look forward to seeing what uh, what happens over the next couple of weeks. So about two months after we put in the grocery row garden and after some photos being sent to us by Sherry of different milestones inside of it like here's a green bean and we got our first potatoes we said we've got to go over and see this system again let's go back and film it and see how it looks after only two months now remember if you planted an orchard you would have very little change after two months you would have some growth on the trees but you're probably not going to get a lot of fruit or anything happening in a grocery row garden system because you are harnessing the power of annual gardening as your trees are getting bigger year after year, you're getting tons of yields before those trees are really doing much of anything other than growing and getting their roots established. So when we went back 60 days later, it was beautiful and super exciting. So we're back two months and a few days later. We put this garden in on March 7th and uh, Sherry's been taking care of it ever since and we wanted you to see what it looks like because I mean just two months and this garden is absolutely kicking what have you uh pulled out so far lots of weeds lots of weeds good <laughs> so lots of lots weeds, of so weeds. <laughs> highly I need, productive i need more malt but um i pulled out a few potatoes uh at least three squash from one huge squash plant that's got eight or nine more growing that's awesome. a couple of peppers kale several times um, the tomatoes are just look like they're starting to turn, possibly. Um, what else? Did you get any green beans yet? Yes, I yes, yes. I did have on one green. Trellis. I had one, one meal in a, a curry type thing that I put some green beans in, but they taste really good just raw. So, and herbs. Oh yeah, the We've herbs used look herbs good. And it's amazing how peppers. fast they came. I mean, this is all like double, triple, quadruple. Yeah, this, this was huge. a tiny little pot, you know. It was a tiny. This one's grown the most, and I don't know what to do with it the most. <laughs> but I'll fix tea. My Tons three, of tea. My three. Well, yeah, but my three-year-old uh, grandson comes out and he'll just eat it. He always wants a lemon leaf. Oh, it smells so good. So that's fine. I see you. Oh, your peppers. Yeah, some of them plants are bigger than others, but there's there's just sprinkled throughout. And you didn't even feed them anything, right? This is just nope, from just, the, just the, the, the decaying and roots. A, and the, a little bit of cow manure that, that right, we put on Right, cow manure that it. we put in. And these are sweet potato vines that are going everywhere. They're already starting to run. That's good. Yeah, they are. And you mulch with grass clippings. See, and then you got to try to get these weeds out underneath them. There's those little oxalis. Oh, your eggplant are just starting to yeah, we're, bloom. We're, we're hoping for lots. They've got little flowers on them. These yeah, are the three great. biggest. There's a couple more in there, but those are cool. I'm excited. And my trees are yeah. crazy. See, we cut them. See, Tiny. we cut that. We cut that right there, and it's got two feet, two feet more growth on it from where we cut it. Yep. And oh, you got your banana peppers coming in. Oh yeah, I sent home with Ooh, my daughter. Those are epic. I'm seeing them all over the place. These are some of the last chance pole beans, just the random handfuls of pole beans that uh, I gave you. Uh huh. And I planted, I would have, next time I would plant double and then select pull out because I would have liked this whole thing to be like really thick with covered, beans. But we'll, we'll live and learn. Yeah, these are awesome. Another fabulous tree. Yeah, that's got a foot on it. That but not happy. just a foot, it's got like tons of leaves. Great, happy, dark green 
That's because I tell them how beautiful they are. <laughs> you got ginger. I do. I've got about ginger six. Coming up. You planted the ginger. Yeah, I know. Just and I didn't know where here and there. I didn't know where you planted of... it. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plants. I think of that. Yeah, I see some here. Yep. They There's look really good. More over there. Really happy. There's some underneath that. Uh, I can't persimmon and there's some over there so kale looks great these were tiny when you stuck them in they were we've I've I've put them on several dishes so far and sometime here soon when I think they're gonna stop growing I'm gonna cut them and dry them and make them into kale chips that's okra 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 Okra. Did you start these from seed? No, these I did not. These, these are I, transplants. These are transplants, but I have several from seed in there too. The cassava's up here in the middle. That's a tiny one. There's bigger ones coming. This squash Look though. At that. Look at that. I've already picked three off of them. This thing. I've never it's ever. Because you told it was beautiful. It is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> all these gorgeous. All these sweet potatoes. When, I don't even remember when I gave you these like like a few weeks ago. They're already Probably flying. about four weeks ago. This is that big. Look at that big that cassava is going to be awesome. And it's entangling with the sweet potato. So. Epic fight. I've got watermelon. I got three of them in here. Try to place them where I, when I pull out potatoes, I have at least a little room to go. Yeah, it's a good idea. So my potato plants are looking. They're getting, <laughs> they make great big vines, which means you should have good yields of potatoes off of them that's a Yukon gold looks like yeah I think so and I saw some of your potatoes had uh, had some seeds they were actually setting fruit which mine didn't do so they must just like you better they must we're gonna have to take some of the seeds and plant them <laughs> cucumbers are growing cucumbers look good they're oh you'll starting. have them fast oh yep they're mm -hmm. making cukes yeah these are the mixed up seeds that I gave you the, the little jar yes, seeds? Yes, um, this one is not. There's several that are. Most of these are from you. And cool. I replanted like later on so that I got like a baby cucumber. I tried one over there but didn't have enough sun because Potatoes of it. Potatoes ran it over. Potatoes ran it over. <laughs> yeah. Look at her. Look at this. We cut it right here. Yep. Right here. Over two feet on this pear. And so within 60 days, you're starting to get harvests and I mean the trees aren't even coming in yet they're just you know they're just taking up space at the moment but wildflowers from wildflowers seed. it's only two months this one little little one that's getting eaten up by something they'll so they'll start flowering eventually one of the one of my favorite things about the system is when you've got you know if you were going to put in an orchard in your backyard you're going to be waiting two years three years four years but this has the the scaffolding of an orchard but then underneath it you've got all the vegetables so it's you know, 60 days you're starting to get food and then you're getting more food at 100 days and more food at 200 days and more food at a year and more food at two years and it just keeps, you know, keeps ramping up because the perennials and the annuals together are giving you a maximum yield. And you I got all kinds of wildflowers. I know. It's crazy. Being taken over by the potato plant. <laughs> yeah, is, but you is... got to come see the tomatoes. Yeah, let's see it. And the blackberry bush. Blackberries, but that's a nice in cane. In between, with a, a small, but once we get some of this out, that'll have more to grow. This one, we just keep tying Ooh, and tying because it's getting bigger and bigger. Oh, those look good. I'm excited because my one daughter just loves tomatoes. So, I'm hoping to share another watermelon. That's here. looking good. And this. I counted. There's over 50 baby cherry tomatoes. Well, they're actually orange. That looks like a super sweet. Potatoes. And then these jalapenos. And I can't remember what these are called. Is that anjos? I don't know. I'll, I'll cut them up and find out. I must admit, I'm not a pepper expert just plant all different seeds and then whatever we get we get <laughs> I'm not I, no I'm not either this blackberry it started down there it's put on four feet so the four question, feet of growth from the base the question is do you leave it grow or do you cut it back down to try to make it more bush like like grow out you could do both 
you can either you can either let it grow and then it's going to fruit on this one or you could prune it here and let it make a few shoots out generally i let them grow long and then later i take the ends of them and i bury the ends here and there to start new blackberries which i then plant elsewhere elsewhere okay so i'll take like the end of this one it gets big but this is going to be your next set of fruit that comes on on this so these these canes will be done these new canes will be like next year's okay. next year's fruit so if you do get more branches that's good uh, there's like high production methods of training and pruning but I usually mostly just leave them alone and bury bits and pieces of them to make more plants as I as I do it now one other thing that's hiding in here is about nine okra plants from seed okay Took about four days to come up they are there's some babies there's some right there they're beautiful. And those they are some all... of my, those were my land race okras where yes. I mixed up all of them. They're mostly red burgundy okra that so, we saved a couple of years. And they're mostly up around in through here in between plants where I know I'm going to pull the potatoes up and then they'll have space to grow. Right, so you'll be going right from your cool season stuff right into your hot season and these will carry all the way to fall. And in the fall, then you turn around and you plant your cabbages and yep. kale and lettuces or whatever else you want to do. And as the okra freezes out, that stuff continues. Usually you can get most of a year in this climate. These are great. So some of these are the Adirondack blue and some of them are the Yukon golds. There's your, Both of them um, are delicious. There's your seeds that you want with the... So those are the potato fruit, which we really, really want to save some of. I didn't so know we can get potato some potato fruit. seed and then plant the seed next year in flats and stick it out in the garden. Okay. It's a, you get massive variation. There could be white potatoes, yellow potatoes, red potatoes, blue potatoes. And I think this small, is a, large. this is a blue potato. Right. So even if it's blue, the, um, the genetics of potatoes are ridiculously complicated. So awesome. the chances are higher that we get blue potatoes, but they're definitely not assured. You can get all kinds of weird things. Well, this is great. This is my garden. How much watering do you have to do? I think I've watered two or three times. This is mostly just, just the rainfall and yeah. the mulch. I made sure if it went like four or five days that I watered it some, but we've actually had our April was really nice and rained about every four or five days. So, it's and perfect. now we hit thunderstorm season. So, <laughs> yeah, now it's definitely going to have plenty of water. Right. You've done great. Right. I'm excited. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for letting us uh, kind of join you on the whole adventure from making it to finishing it. So this is, uh, this is awesome. This is like so encouraging to come back and see how, uh, how beautiful it looks after only two months. Good work. We were just so excited to have this chance to put in a garden with some friends in a different place from where we were, close but far enough away and suburban and you know just smaller space and people that were very interested in gardening but hadn't really done much gardening before to just have this experience of teamwork and putting together something like this and then being able to go back and visit it now it's been it's really really fun and to see how enthusiastic both Leo and Sherry are and the family and the grandkids that are coming over I just love it this is a great little backyard system and it appeals to everybody from the very organized to the very disorganized it's kind of the best of all worlds I find combining permaculture with kind of a controlled row garden situation and it's hard to beat. In some of my other videos and in the Little Grocery Row Gardening book I explain where these ideas came from. This is not all brand new to me. I call it the exciting new permaculture gardening system and it is exciting and new in a sense but it's also very old in another sense and it's also based on some modern ideas that are based on some older ideas and on you know, it's like you're standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm sure people have planted edible hedgerow systems before. It's happened all through history. And you've got Stefan Subkowiak up in Quebec, total temperate climate, growing his permaculture orchard in these great big wide rows. And he was the one that gave me the idea. It's like shopping, right? He said it's like shopping to go down through these orchards and see it. I said, like, that's it. I want to shop on a backyard scale. And about five years or more before I saw his permaculture orchard video, I had been making these 
four foot wide beds and mixing them into the middle of my annual gardens as a place for pollinators and small fruits and various plants that my kids wanted to grow, making these little perennial beds because I was thinking pollinators could always be here and predators could always be here. And we've got this little bunker of life, this island of life in the middle of the annual gardens which are getting ripped out, down to bare, planted again, stripped, planted, stripped, and there's this bunker where all the ladybugs could live and where all the pollinators could come regularly, plus we could get some yields out of it and some perennial herbs right in the middle of our annual garden. So I had this idea and I was, whoa, this is cool. And then I saw the permaculture orchard with Stefan Subkowiak and said, oh man, this is like commercial scale and really cool because this whole system is like this. And then as I was talking about the beauty of edible hedges and what I was thinking in my mind about making edible hedgerows into a garden, somebody said, have you seen Ernst Goetz down in Brazil, tropical climate? who does these incredible row, wide, wide row gardens with a huge amount of biomass and he basically cuts everything down with a chainsaw and feeds it to the ground and he's got all these successive systems for his agriculture and it's called Syntropic Agriculture. I said, whoa, so watch some of his videos and uh, somebody gave me some translations of some of it and I went, this is awesome. This is so cool. How can we bring these type of commercial systems into a backyard scale where you can just go shopping for your food and your medicine and your flowers and everything through the backyard? Your fruit trees and your vegetables all in harmony together. How can we harvest annuals and perennials? How can we make an orchard that is way more productive? And if you wanted to, you could walk away from all of your annuals and your small herbs and everything and just mow the entire area and you would still have an orchard because it's got orchard spacing to it. How can we use some of the small fruit tree ideas like grow a little fruit tree if you haven't read that book or Dave Wilson Nurseries growing two or three trees in one hole and pruning trees really small. How can we incorporate that into a garden system. So with much experimentation, the grocery row gardening system was built. And it's been exciting to see how many people have sent me pictures of their grocery row gardens and said, I'm doing this here and I'm doing this here. I've got from South Africa and from Canada and from the tropics and oh, I planted this and I planted this and I planted this and I keep getting these pictures. And I love it because it's something we can kind of crowdsource and we can work on together. And if you're interested in learning how the system works, you can watch my videos here like and subscribe to this channel or you can get the little grocery row gardening book it's just a little teeny eeny weeny book and it gives the whole overview of the system with no fluff here's the inspirations for the system here's how you install it here's how it works and here's how you maintain it over time and keep those fruit trees small so i hope you've enjoyed this presentation i know it's a lot longer than usual but i wanted to give a really in-depth multi-month look at grocery row gardening and I really thank Leo and Sherry and Kervin and Brooklyn and the rest of their family, as well as my wife for filming and my kids for helping with the weeding and installing of this garden. Over time, we'll go back and visit it again and I hope you'll join me. And until next time, may your thumbs always be green. Discover the beauty and efficiency behind Grocery Row Gardening. Create a backyard where fruits, herbs, vegetables, and flowers all grow together within proper spacing. In Grocery Row Gardening, you'll find the tools and systems you need to keep your family fed.